Hey, Kelvin. Hey, Kevin. Hi, Dr. T. Hi, Dr. T. How are we doing, guys? It's uh, it's really cold, so <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. I've been freezing my toes off today. Yeah, it's it's bad. <laughs> All of a sudden. Yeah, it was like oh, 45 good. degrees last night. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it's going to start freezing. We're going to get frost and all that good stuff. <laughs> hmm.
Does anybody have a an interesting background that they could share with me? What what background? Oh, like I just have stupid grass. Oh, <laughs> oh, like picture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Kenya. 
No. What's up, Dr. Terrell? I'm good, I'm good, but I have to revise my prayer statement. I must say, hi, Kenya's picture, because all I see are pictures of some people. There she is! Yay! Oh, hi, Dr. Terrell. Hello, how are you? I am so happy. <laughs> and there's Calvin, who's freezing his booty off. <laughs> oh, almost there. And there's a teacher. Okay, well, I'm gonna go back to putting my picture on because um, <gasps> what? I'm a mess, Doctor R. I'm You're not a mess. You're a person. You're a real life, warm-blooded person. I can talk to. Please don't leave me. Okay. Whatever. Said so to get that out. Aditya, I'm just gonna have to talk to you the whole time. Sounds good. All righty. Just gonna be me and you. <clears throat> Do I get an A? Uh, yes, you get an A. You get an A in this semester, as so long as you don't. Ah, uh, Adam's there, Dan's there, Kenya's there, <laughs> Carla's there. What? Is Adam eating peanut butter? He just like randomly laughed. I know, I know. His, he had a spoon. He yeah, has something like chili or something. Or it could be, it could be cocoa puffs for all I know. <clears throat> all righty. So, um, uh, can you guys see the uh, paper? No. You're not screen sharing today. Oh, oh, geez. I got a screen share. Oops. There we go. Here we are. Does this make sense? Can you guys see it now? Yep. Okay. Yep, Good. we can see it. Yay. Okay. So um, now I'm sort of counting on y'all being as lazy as I have been. Uh, but let me just check to make double sure. How many of you have read this article in the time between the last lecture and now? Okay. I, I think the question is, who hasn't read it? Okay. Um, no, no, no. No, I want to. I don't know. I don't know. And say who hasn't. I downloaded it. That's a good start. That's a good start. No, no, you see, I'm checking on who's been lazy, like, because I haven't done diddly squat on this part because, oh, for one thing, uh, my wife Mitra had her gallbladder removed this uh, weekend. I had to take her into a, the emergency room on Friday. How is she doing? But she's she's okay now. She's fine. I, I uh, uh, we're hoping for a much healthier girl after all is said and done. But um, so, Doctor Terrell, yeah, does that mean that you're gonna be um, like changing your diet also, like along with your wife? Uh well, uh, my diet has actually been changing. Um, my, my wife is, she's Iranian, right? And she's extremely culturally Iranian, right? And so her diet is never, ever going to change, right? Because they have a folk remedy for everything. And, you know, oh, this is good for your blood. This is good for your heart. This is good for your eyes, you know? And so I'm like, oh, great, you know? And whatever. And so I don't think she's going to change her diet at all. But she was producing massive gallstones and her gallbladder was about to pop. And I took her into the emergency room on Friday and they just said, okay, thanks. Now go away. Right. And it was like, uh, but uh, my, what, my wife, mine, my, my, and they just said, no, you get out of here. 
we're going to take her. And so they took her in and she spent two nights in emergency and two nights in the hospital. Then on Monday morning. Which hospital? It was a, a Kaiser in Walnut Creek. Because Mitra, Mitra and I have separate homes. She lives in Dublin and I live in San Jose. And um, uh, uh, I just saw somebody go by Adam. I was, it just freaked me out. So but, that's, um, my, that's my sugar glider of a wife. Oh, okay. Well, maybe she should hear this because this this speaks how yeah, chemistry I'll wives how right. chemistry wives are treated. But um, but yeah. So Monday morning, I got this call. Oh, there, I mean, it was just like, oh, they're gonna do surgery now. No, it's delayed. You're gonna do surgery now. No, it's delayed. And that went on like day and night until Monday morning. I I called and there was no answer and. I heard, oh, she went in, they took her in for surgery and they did this um, laparoscopic surgery. She got three holes in her belly and they took the gallbladder out of one of them, my God. And, um, and uh, then they just like, okay, get out of here. It's like, what? <laughs> I've been here for, I'm like, I put down roots, you know? So I went and picked her up on Monday and, uh, uh, and she was she was kind of groggy still, but um, by the time I got her home, she was she was in a little bit more pain. But I think she's doing better, you know, because uh, you know she could feel the the surgery pain, but not the obviously not the gallbladder. And did then they, what did they remove the gallbladder through her belly button? Um, it wasn't actually through the belly button, but it was there were there were three holes in her abdomen, two on the side and one above the belly button. Oh. So, yeah. And, uh, and so that was, that was basically my weekend. And then, um, uh, then I got ready for Chem 55 this morning and didn't do too dreadful a job there. And, and, and now us, and this is all by way of making the lame, excuse that we're just going to read the stupid paper today together and i don't care if you've already read it we're going to read it again and most of you haven't read it i know because i asked earlier <laughs> okay so um uh carla would you be so kind as to read the abstract for me here that on can you hear me perfectly okay i wasn't sure <laughs> so you want me to just read it like we're just reading it <laughs> like high school yeah yeah just read it just like high school <laughs> okay um the rapid refolding dynamics of apomyoglobin are followed by a new temperature jump fluorescence technique on a 15 nanosecond to 0.5 millisecond time scale in vitro. The apparatus measures the protein folding history in a single sweep in standard aqueous buffers. The earliest steps during folding to a compact state are observed and are complete in under 20 microseconds. Experiments on mutants and consideration of steady state circular dichroism and fluorescence spectra indicate that the observed microsecond phase monitors assembly of an AHG helix subunit um, measurements at different viscosities indicate diffusive behavior even at low viscosities in agreement with the motions of a solvent exposed protein during initial collapse. Excellent. Thank you so much. That blows me away. That was very, very well done. And um, so uh, let's, un let's unpack a few of these uh, sentences. So um, temperature jump, what's, what's meant by that? Change in temperature? Yes. Uh, change in what, in what direction? Don't they increase the temperature by like pulsing it as yep. a laser? Yep, 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 exactly. So here's our scorecard. This is uh, 
Kenya, Carla. Carla gets two because she read it. Kenya gets one because she answered it. We're doing the pseudo extra credit thing again? Yes. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. This is the wall of shame. <laughs> Love it. Okay. So, temperature increase, temperature jump. Uh, how long does the temperature jump take? Does anybody remember? Okay. Scanning down. Really fast. Yes, it's really fast. That's good. That was Carla, right? Uh, okay. Der aqueous buffer is directly and rapidly heated up to 5 billion kelvins per second by a nanosecond infrared Raman pulse. So approximately how long is the Heating pulse. A nanosecond. Excellent. And it gets to about one nanosecond, exactly. Perfect. So how far does light travel in one nanosecond? One foot. I knew that one. It's literally one light foot. Okay. So it's, it's a very short time, right? But it's actually a time that we can, you can measure it on a, on a, 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 a commercially available oscilloscope, an uh, inexpensive commercially available oscilloscope. So there you go. So, um, all right. Uh, so in one nanosecond, you can heat it uh, 20 Kelvin, right? That's 20 divided by one E minus nine equals what? Who knows the answer? Come on. This is math, not hard math. Plus 20, you're gonna get- 29. 29? E9 to the power of one. Oh, 20, ah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. 20 E9, right. Who was that? Was that Hikun? Ah, excellent Hikun, good. It's one point. But what is 20 E9 in English? What unit is that? What are the units on the value? Isn't, isn't that nano? No, there's no nano anymore. Is it giga? No, no, no. Uh, okay, yeah, it's giga, but what? Giga a second? No. A gigasecond is a thousand years. Is it, is it the <laughs> the Kelvin? Yes. Come on, the the units on twenty e nine. Kelvin per second. Yes, exactly. So, how would you express that using the word giga? That's another one for Kenya. Use, use giga, 20 blank, blank per blank. Giga Kelvin per second? Excellent, Kenya gets two. Total, excellent, good, okay. Okay, I went from three to two, how, how does that work? Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> Good catch. <laughs> I love it. I'm robbing you, man. I'm robbing you. I didn't even mean it. 
Okay, this is going to be a uh, shame game. A shame game. No, not TXT. Okay. So, oops. Actually, I have to get this on screen so it can stay. No, no, no. Twenty giga Kelvin per second. Is that a high temperature heating rate or a low temperature temperature heating rate? Very high. Excellent. Richard gets very high. One. Excellent. Now, um, <clears throat> Apparatus measures the protein folding history. I kind of disagree. It measures one dimension, one or maybe two dimensions of this thing, but okay. In a single sweep, what they mean by a single sweep is, who can take a guess? This is actually, it relies on your knowledge a little bit of this type of um, uh, fast measurement a little bit, but Anybody get an idea there? Don't they just okay. mean that they do it in like one experiment? Right, right, one experiment. And more, more, um, yeah, basically. It's, there's a single sample that's temperature jumped and then that single sample is monitored during the entire um, heating pro or, um, folding process and and it's not the temperature jump isn't repeated there's only one temperature jump and then the entire folding uh, process over that 20 microseconds is recorded in a series of fluorescence lifetime measurements does that make sense so that only really makes sense unless you're familiar with boxcar averaging or the type of averaging that's often done in order to slice things into extremely short time slices. And that's where you set up a measurement. Oh, it's so cool. Calvin's head disappears. His head disappears into the background sometimes. <laughs> oh, it's gonna go, it's gonna go. There it's going. Ah! Okay, ah, almost went. Anyway, so um, if you, if you do an experiment over and over, but then let's say it's an excitation emission experiment, something like that. There are sometimes called pump probe. <laughs> and then what you can do is you can pump with a very short intense pulse, right? And then you can probe at later times. But if it's just a molecule looking at dissociation or um, some other very, it's like a, a very reproducible phenomenon, maybe some small molecule thing, then you can just set a time delay and you can, you can set, you know, a one nanosecond delay, right? And you can pump probe, pump probe, pump probe at one nanosecond. And then when your signal to noise ratio on that measurement gets large enough, then you can increase the de delay and measure at two nanoseconds. Let's say for one nanosecond, then three nanoseconds for one nanosecond, then four, five, six. And by doing it over and over, you can sort of map out the, the temporal space by signal averaging over a bazillion bazillions of, of uh, pump uh, executions. In this case, the pump is the temperature jump, right? That's what's triggering all the physical activity is the temperature jump. And then the protein responds, by folding up, temperature jump, and then it's like, oh my God, I'm out of, out of equilibrium, and then it goes, and it zips up into its new shape, right? And it's the time frame of that initial refolding that uh, Grubly is getting at in this experiment. That makes sense? First one that says yes or no gets a point. Yes. 
Excellent. Adam, Adam gets a point. Yes. And um, uh, how does uh, that make? Yes. That wasn't me. I thought that was Richard. That was Richard. Oh, that was Richard. <laughs> but I'll tell you, Richard. I feel like Adam no. also gets a point for being honest. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Half a point now, no. Now, I, I, I get it, I get it. I like honesty too, but if I'm being honest, he gets nothing. So, um, so, so Richard, um, uh, do you think that everybody else gets it too or not? Yes, I think so. You think so, okay. All right, you may lose your point here because now I'm going to ask Aditya what I meant by pumping and probing. So uh, it's when the water, or sorry, the uh, area is heated up really quickly and mm -hmm. the uh, protein, which is unfolded, um, I guess. Mm -hmm needs to now go to equilibrium then it folds mm -hmm. up tracking that folding mm -hmm. exactly exactly right so this experiment actually that's worth a point right there that's pretty good because that's exactly what is done in this experiment but this is said this is said to be done in a single sweep and what is meant by that in this case? Are you still so, me or? Yeah, I'm asking anybody who answers, but you're, you got first shot, let's say. So what, what what's meant by the single sweep? Yeah. Isn't it just what Carla said where everything is just done in one single go in like one experiment, I guess? Mm-hmm. You had to say what Carla said, huh? That was very that was very chivalrous of you, but I can't give you another point now. If you had just paraphrased her, then I would have given you a point. I mean, you can just take one of hers and give it to me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Good well, try. I would that. say I read the paper, <laughs> so I deserve a point for having oh, read the paper. <laughs> all right, all right, Carla. I like gets... biophysics. This is my all thing. Right. One extra point for Carla for reading the paper. Good. No wonder if she did so well with the abstract. All right. So the single sweep is means that they only that they get a set of data from a single temperature pulse. They don't have to repeat the pulse over and over. Because, you know, on this, for these types of experiments where there's a large temperature jump and there's proteins, and proteins can get screwed up you know proteins have this manifold of folding states and if you keep folding them and refolding them they're likely to all get denatured and never come back right does that make sense i mean i could be wrong am i wrong dan no that's that's what i would say too i mean there's lots of things Excellent. That happen. you get a point <laughs> Excellent. All right. All right. Dan's on the board for agreeing with me. I like it. <laughs> All right. So we have yet to hear from Kai, Ivy, Lily, Pauline, and um, Leslie. So uh, let's see here. So the uh, the earliest steps during folding to a compact state are observed and are complete in under 20 microseconds. As a matter of fact, this experiment did not yield information beyond about 20 microseconds. So they say that they go from 15 to uh, 500 microseconds, right? 15 nanoseconds to 500 microseconds. But really there was no additional information after 20 microseconds. So, um, so folding to a compact state. Um, that that's 
um, the amount of detail that they're able to get from this experiment, it's not crystallography, right? They couldn't get a crystallograph of the um, unfolded and the folded states and everything in between. But what they did get was a, the distance between a tryptophan and a, a serine, I think. It was some, a thio something or a serine? Uh, yeah, it definitely had sulfur because didn't that quench the luminescence? Yeah, oh, sorry, it's a met, it's a methi methionine. Sorry, it's a methionine. Right, right, exactly. Excellent. That's good. Definitely had a sulfur. Yes. Okay. So there's so what they were able to do really was measure as a function of time. <clears throat> this distance, right? And there's a couple of aspects to it. They're, they got two different lifetimes, right? But it turns out most of the information was in one of them. I don't, I don't really understand that. Right? Um, I guess it just means that it's not super, super simple, but, but hey, that's all right. So, um, all right. So, um, So it, it was done in under 20 microseconds, good. Experiments on mutants, right? So they actually had some uh, uh, mutant horse, or it was a whale apal myoglobin that they used in this. And then they compared that to horse apal myoglobin. And then they had a mutant of the whale apal myoglobin compared. And they looked at it and they, ba they were basically playing around with the um, uh, tryptophan and methionine groups to see if they affected the folding, something like that. Uh, but uh, but experiments with these guys, and cons in consideration of a steady state um, circular dichroism and fluorescence, indicate that the observed microsecond phase monitors the assembly of an A dot HG helix subunit. So um, I forget what these letters mean right now because I didn't do my stupid homework, but does anybody remember what those letters mean? Carla, maybe? Okay. I think they're just referring to like subunit, like domains. Mm-hmm, 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 okay. Right. Okay. So it's the assembly of this, the G domain, the H domain, and the A domain into some sort of, this is probably a, a, a tertiary structure, you know, where uh, some sort of beta, uh, beta sheet and the helix sort of arrange themselves in space, right? <clears throat> so they're, they're, they're speculating that, you know, based on their circular dichroism, right, and their steady and their uh, constant temperature fluorescence, that the, um, the changes on the microsecond scale that they see relate to the assembly of this tertiary structure, right, this um, helix subunit. Whatever that actually that means, it's sort of in crystallographic terms. So, um, and one thing they were able to do is measure at different viscosities. And this is a rather a cryptic statement, so I'm not really sure what it means, but let's see if we can pick it apart. Measurements at different viscosities indicate diffusive behavior, even at low viscosities. So, I don't really understand that because to me, diffusion is the, it's like the highest rate of a chemical reaction is the diffusion limited rate. And so,
this sort of indicates that there's some sort of maybe some internal protein kinetics that are somewhat independent of solvent viscosity. But then they go on to say, in agreement with motions of the solvent exposed proteins during the, the initial collapse, right? <clears throat> so, I don't know. And the initial collapse here, this most likely means the formation of the folded structure from the cold denatured structure. Yay. Roger gets one. So that was a difficult explanation. Giving myself a grade. Okay, so um, who would like to read the first paragraph? First paragraph. Someone other than Carla. Someone named oh, Aditya. Yeah. Okay. okay, so someone in Kenya. Someone named Kenya. I mean, I meant Kenya. I meant Kenya. I meant, I really did. I meant. Okay, okay, okay. Thank okay. you, thank you, thank oh, you. Oh, okay. First paragraph, got it. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Let me prepare myself here. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. A compact molten globule state has been proposed as an early pro protein folding intermediate in many cases, but it is initial formation from the unfolded state during refolding has not been directly observed. Slower, greater than one millisecond, kinetic phases of protein folding leading from the molten globule state to the native state or from the unfolded state to the fully native state directly have been resolved by stop flow techniques the nanosecond to sub millisecond time scale in which the earliest global protein folding motions are expected to occur is not easily accessible by these techniques. Do I keep going? You're muted, Dr. Terrell. I muted myself, no. You don't go on, it's perfect. You're just harvesting points. So, uh, so this is sort of a stupid thing to say. A compact molten globule state has been proposed as an early protein folding intermediate in many cases. Okay, whatever. Molten globule. Wait, how is it stupid? I don't know. It's just like well, I'm glad like, that's that's just the terminology for protein folding. I'm I'm a, I'm offended. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So it's initial formation from there's unfolded to molten globule to native, right? Unfolded molten globule native. All right. I mean, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is it seems like it's kind of a fancy way of saying something fairly simple. Would you, would you agree to that, Carl, maybe, or no? Isn't that all of science? What? They find Probably. fancy ways to say something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So that actually gets um, uh, that gets you on the board, Adam. He identified one of the modus operandi of scientists, which is sophistry. And we can look that one up too. But but yeah, so it's it feels to me like it's like a little bit of a fancy way of saying we don't know what the hell it is, but it's globular. And molten globule, like what does it mean that it's molten? It means it's at some higher free energy state, right? Anyways, so, but molten, I guess it implies that it's fluid, right? That it can be changing configurations, right? Excellent. Okay, nobody even agreed with me there, so no points. No points yeah, it kind me. of means that Dr. Uh, Russ, um, Terrell. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> that like yeah. half of it or so is unfolded or or it's about 50% unfolded, folded ish. That's what molten globule means? It's like a partially folded state because if it wasn't folded, it would just be called unfolded. Okay. So yeah. I know ma I know many good scientists, and all of them are perfectly capable of saying partially folded. And partially folded versus molten globule is only one syllable difference. So they would have to rationalize using molten globule. It sounds was, cooler. It sounds cooler. Damn it, I have to give Adam another point. Damn it. But actually, Kenya and Carla get both one point there, too, because they argued with me. Oops, oops, oops. That's, I went, you went from five to one, five to one, six. Five. Wouldn't it also be better to use molten globule over partially folded? Because partially folded, this is talking about like early protein folding, and partially folded could be any transition point along the way. I kind of like that, but I want you to explain because I don't really understand it. But I want you to like. Well, well, because yeah, like you're ahead. saying, like like partially folded, so it's still more like fluid than yeah. like if it was like almost completely folded, right? Like, yeah, you're talking about something that can still like move a little bit, still has some room to kind of like maybe fold incorrectly. But like, if you're more towards like the end of the transition state, you're almost completely folded. There's very little wiggle room. So it wouldn't quite be molten. I like that. I actually really like that analysis. Lily, that's two points right there. Okay. She's on the board. Okay. So I believe now. Okay, so um, so what is a stopped flow technique? Nobody knows. Hey, can can you repeat the question again, Doctor Terrell? Uh, what is a stopped flow technique? Isn't it like a mixing device? Yes, it is. Would you characterize that mixing device by as fast or slow? Fast. Excellent. Good answer. So it's a fast mixing device. Perfect. But it's hard to mix things in, you know, the might, you know, the hundreds of milliseconds is about as fast as you can mix stuff because things have to diffuse you know and water is viscous enough that it just doesn't happen instantly so stop flow is really not a super fast technique for me so so it's like it's actually a more like what you can denature proteins with guanidine you can, or like a high salt, there's a bunch of ways to do it. So if you mix a protein with some high salt, you can watch it unfold, right? Of course, that's a, that's a one-way street, right? It just goes from folded to, you know, God knows what, right? But uh, they chose not to do that here, right? So, um, Okay, here's some stuff I don't really understand that well. Like helix coil transition, I'm not really sure what that is. Uh, unfolding of RNA, say, all right. Oh, they did an infrared absorption after temperature. Dr. Jump. Dr. Terrell? Yes. So helix coil transition is, I think, when you have like multiple helix and they're forming a coil together. Um, and I think Carla, or or idea can probably add to that if they want to. Oh, really? Aditya, Carla? I mean, I think that, yeah, it's 
it's it's I think that's considered like quaternary structure, isn't it? Since you have coils at that point interacting no, that's with each other. Structure. Qu- quaternary is when you have multiple. Sorry, structures. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't count. That's it's okay. The <laughs> yeah, I so the right. secondary structure is when you have a helix or a beta sheet forming, but then tertiary is when you start forming um multiple like helices coming together or like you have the beta sheets also um right. added to that. so for okay. Example, okay. They're forming the like the final structure of, of the protein already excellent 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 not necessarily not necessarily a protein complex but a protein right not necessarily an aggregate aggregate of proteins which are so often important in biology but at least the one protein the single strand is like it's coming into its final shape. Okay, I accept that. So, uh, okay, okay. I think we're we're going to move forward here. Yeah? Um, okay. So, how about infrared absorption after a temperature change? Actually, there's. A, I, I was looking for newer papers on this subject, and uh, somebody did. Um, Raman, they did Raman studies on a protein uh, to follow the folding. And that made a lot of sense to me. So um, infrared can be fairly fast, but still uh, to get an infrared spectrum, um, there are some dilemmas. And one of them is that if you want a fast spectrum, you either need a fast interferometer, that is one where there's a physical mirror moving very quickly, or you need a, um, a dispersive infrared instrument with a, an array of MC, uh, mercury cadmium telluride. Uh, detectors. So there's MCT or H- HCT, they're sometimes called, and they're mercury doped cadmium telluride. And they form photodiodes that you can use to detect infrared quanta, infrared photons. So that's a little. Um, these are some of the difficulties with infrared absorption fast infrared absorption. You can get into the, maybe call it one millisecond per scan, something like that. Um, However, with Raman, you can actually do better because Raman, you can look at visible or near infrared photons and you can use a fast detector for that and when you're doing Raman, you can actually, um, well, you can get more photons by using a more powerful laser, basically. So anyway, so infrared are, I think, a very promising way to add additional information to this type of measurement. However, the first one to go into the microsecond time scale was this fluorescence method. This um, tryptophan fluorescence. So how about um, NMR line shape measurements? Does anybody know anything about that? Okay. So NMR, you know that um, the NMR that we're mostly familiar with is of a static molecule, right? And what you're observing is the relaxation time of different uh, no relaxation time and relaxation frequency of given protons. So. Um, let me, let me bust out my little camera here. And I can give a, 
a not to be quoted description of NMR line shapes. And uh, that is, if you have, um, A proton resonance for state A, and a proton resonance for state B, and there's some difference in um, In their, um, uh, in their chemical shift, right? The, uh, if you have two static populations, and let's, say, let's say you have A is in equilibrium with B, right? This could be a keto enol transition, for example. And uh, you could say, oh, well, here's the keto. And here's the enol. Right. However, if that at this this is true for a slow uh, a slow interconversion. However, if there's a fast interconversion what you'll see instead is a, a peak that looks like the average, the time average of those two. This will be for a fast interconversion. Because um, on the time scale that it takes the proton spins to relax, they may be sampling, they may be going through the keto and the enol form several times. And so that means that their, their chemical shift will be averaged between those two values. Right, and actually a slow inner conversion would actually look like, like that. They would both be present, right? And I guess the top one would be completely static, either stuck as keto or stuck as enol, right? And then a slow inner conversion would be this, and then a fast one would look like, would look like a, a single broad peak. So um, that's all really I had to say about that. That's just the, that's one way to measure. It's a good structure sensitive tool to use to measure uh, protein structures, but it's also a little bit slow because the relaxation times are uh, in the high milliseconds for, um, uh, for most protons. So, uh, whoops. This doesn't get much smaller, so I'll just put it away. Okay, so, uh, and don't worry about the electron transfer thing, that's stupid. Anyway. Uh, and then there's a temperature jump method developed by obviously his sworn enemies because he doesn't describe them in any way whatsoever. <laughs> you know? I actually talked to Martin Grubley. This is part, this is one of the reasons that I focused on this, is I met Martin Grubley in the lab when I was at U University of Illinois in 1993 or four or five or something. No, no, five or six or seven, 95, six or seven. Yeah, because I started here in fall of 98. But um, 
And he described this experiment to me. I said, well, you know, and I basically, I just so brown nosed the guy, it's terrible. But I said, you know, I find it very, very remarkable that you've taken such an ambitious leap in the scientific endeavor. Like, just shut me up. Anyway, I just totally just had to pull it out there, you know, when I was done. But, uh, but I got to know the guy and it was a pretty interesting experiment, you know? So, and he was, he was, um, let's say he was comfortable being, being kind of lauded like that. So that's, I guess that's, everything was okay, I guess. <laughs> uh, let's see here. All right, so, um, okay, so let's discuss the theoretical part here real quickly. Um, who wants to read this uh, paragraph? Maybe Ivy? Lee? Sure. Excellent, thank you, Ivy. Good. Theoretical models currently under discussion address various issues of early folding. A general principle that has emerged is that of minimal frustration. A free energy funnel to the native state provides enough, perhaps just enough, smoothness to balance the natural roughness of the folding free energy uh, surface expected for a heteropolymer, thus allowing fairly efficient folding. Depending on the relative location of the transition state, the glass-like transition and the roughness and sloping of the free energy surface, this scenario has been played out analytically and in simulations in many limits, including direct two-state folding, collapse to folding, intermediates of varying amounts of secondary and tertiary structure, and kinetic traps. One certainty is that, at least trans transiently, the protein must pass through a compact ensemble of states while folding. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Ivy. Very well put. Get you on the board here. So, um, I, this is a pretty speculative paragraph, I think, but um, uh, let's just go through some of the thoughts here. Uh, minimal frustration probably refers to the feeling uh, that most computational biochemists feel when they think about protein folding, which is it's never gonna be solved because there, there's so many degrees of freedom. When you, when you just, like, this is probably, I don't know, 100 kilodaltons or something, this stupid protein. Uh, I forget. But let's say it's 100,000 molecular weight, right? There's, you know, probably 10,000 or uh, maybe maybe a thousand different bond angles that can continuously change that determine the three-dimensional structure of this damn thing. And so to simulate that with a computer is basically impossible. You know, to just simulate it like brute force. So um, <laughs> minimal frustration here probably means uh, as it's probably a tongue-in-cheek expression for the number of number of like kind of local minima in the in the highly multi-dimensional folding space that a protein can sample. So. I am very fond of the free energy funnel idea. And the free energy funnel is one that it's hard to grasp um, uh, intuitively, but it kind of has to be the case. Because if you imagine, uh, most proteins are, have, you know, 10 to the, 450 possible folding states, you know? And in case you haven't checked recently, 
10 to the 450 is a large number, right? And so that means that how they get from birth to fully folded is, you know, has to be guided by something and it has to be guided by something specific and strong. <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's not to say that there's always one uh, single uh, tertiary structure for a given primary structure, a given protein, but for a great majority of them, there is only one. There's only one effective tertiary fully folded structure. So how does it get down this way? My thought is that there are um, fairly powerful electrostatic forces that are guiding the geometries of these different amino acids and limiting their mobilities as they're born, right? And then the, the, the transitions between, let's say, the formation of an alpha helix, for example, can be can be like it can be floppy and then lock into that helix, and then there'll be another floppy part and then lock into that turn, right? And so there's there are electrostatic actions through dis through space, right? That um, that are operative, that um, that provide a direction to the folding. And that's what the, the idea of the funnel is. Like there's many, many dimensions, but they're all pointed downhill in a certain direction that favors this finely folded state. You know, and, um, <clears throat> you know, it could be, uh, you know, and the idea that it's a rough free energy surface is simply that there are so many different poss possibilities, right? Okay. Um, does anybody have any complaints about what I've just said? No complaints, but a uh, quick clarification. So since they're uh, looking for a compact state, are they not looking for the properly folded state, but rather just any of those compact formations? Right. Um, that's a good question. Uh, so I think um, <clears throat> in this case, uh, the um, yeah, there, there, there's this is a sort of a an exercise in like imagination. This paragraph, right? So like, they're like imagining all these different possibilities, right? You know, and so like here, they, they say that a free energy funnel describes how a hetero, heteropolymer can have a fairly efficient folding, right? So what is meant by a heteropolymer? Who can answer that? It's a polymer, but its monomers are different. <laughs> okay. What? Well, um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's a good general description of it. That's a good general description of it. Yes, in this case, it would be like different amino acid sequences. It's not the same. Exactly. Like a, 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 or whatever. Exactly. Exactly. That would be a homopolymer. A heteropolymer of amino acids is a polymer. Right? So this is a general description, right? So they're kind of like taking a general idea of this, of the protein and saying like, what, you know, how can it fold, right? That was two points right there, Carla. That put you in the lead. You are now leading Kenya by one point. Which hey, Dr. Me, Yes. 
You should see the, the Wikipedia link that Dan sent because on there you see unfolded, molten globule, and then, you know, the folded protein. Oh my God. It'll give you a nice visual of what we were talking about earlier. It's actually another term too, which is pre-molten globule. Okay, all right, all right, all right. All right. Dan gets a point. I like it. Let's look at let's look it up. Let's look at it up. Yeah, right. Yeah, so here now let me challenge something here. This is free energy, right? Unfolded, it's just like all these random things. Then there's molten globule where the secondary structures have formed pretty much. There's a, a beta and an alpha part there, right? Maybe. And then this uh, native state where there's, you know, more, I don't know, maybe there's more secondary structure, right? But the, uh, this is now all the uh, tertiary and secondary structure. But I would simply um, add here that this is a one-dimensional description of a 500 dimensional space. And I don't really think that there is any way to say that this is a global minimum for that space, right? This is the form, this is the form that it takes, right? But if you heat it up and recool it, it does not go back to this. It goes back to some other weird ass state, you know, some denatured state. So, or I don't actually, know. Yeah. Like, the, mm -hmm. in a lot of biophysics stuff these days, people are talking about how the native state isn't even just one point. Um, it can be like a multitude of like an average of different kind of native like states. And so there's right. that, but there's also metamorphic proteins in which that there's like more than one native state and it can move Interesting. between those. So. Interesting. I love it. I love it. The world is catching up with us. Okay, brilliant. Okay, so, um, so, I mean, you guys are now well equipped to understand how pitiful this whole paper is in terms of like actually getting toward, towards any real answers. But nonetheless, I think it's interesting to put some numbers on things, you know? So, um, okay. Uh, let's see, who wants to read this last, art, uh, last paragraph here? How about, um, how about Leslie? Uh, Leslie not home. Leslie's not home. Hi, Leslie. Hi. Okay, how about Pauline? What? <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Pauline. Blah, 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 blah. Pauline. <laughs> Would you like to read this paragraph here? Not really, I'm wearing a mask. Do <laughs> uh, you have a better excuse? I'm in the lab right now. Oh, that's I'm not even- Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Uh, that's not even, that's not even an excuse. That's, that's an <laughs> anti-excuse. I was just checking you can hear me. I'm wearing my mask right now. Okay, all right. So Can get I, reading. Okay. Get reading, young lady. <laughs> <laughs> to investigate early folding events in globular proteins, we have developed an apparatus that allows us to monitor the T-jumped induced refolding dynamics of small proteins. It extends time resolution to the nanosecond time scale and temperature differentials to 30 Kelvin. 
allowing easier observation of larger population changes at shorter times. Some of the requirements in developing our approach were as follows. Nanoseconds to milliseconds time coverage with nanosecond resolution and dead time to follow the earliest large scale backbone motions up to the stopped flow time regime. Two, a single shot acquisition of the sample's history without pump probe signal averaging or sample flow to allow for small sample quantities, genetically engineering ones. Three, experiments in simple aqueous buffers obviating mm -hmm. yeah. the need for extraneous dyes or other molecules that could affect early folding dynamics. And four, the possibility of fluorescent CD or infrared monitoring in different viscosities, temperature, or denaturant concentration ranges. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Pauline. You're officially on the board. Cool. So, um, so they basically pushed it to nanoseconds, pushed it, they have a large temperature differential. And um, <clears throat> so, requirement number one nanosecond to millisecond time coverage with nanosecond resolution and nanosecond dead time in order to follow the early backbone motions. Early, earliest on, all the way up to the stop flow, like the millisecond time regime. Does that make sense? Single shot acquisition of a sample's history without pump probe signal averaging. We already went over that. Or sample flow, right? They're not, we're not blasting it so hard that it's destroying it as we measure it, right? So you don't have to flow a new piece in there. Um, so that allows them to use a small amount of uh, protein, like a genetically engineered one, which they do. Um, and then experiments in simple aqueous buffers. I don't really get that connection to the to them not needing dyes, right? I don't get the connection between aqueous buffers simple aqueous buffers and the need for dyes. I mean, they can do it in water, in the native water, yay, that's good. That's a good requirement. And but that's not really connected to an experiment that does not need a dye. They don't have a label on the protein, right? They didn't put a fluorophore on there and watch that fluorophore moved around. They used a native protein fluorophore, which is a trip because tryptophans have weak fluorescence, right? Um, and then the possibility, and so this last one is just something they just did because they could. And they're adding it to this list of shit that they required, but it's just they did it because they could. Um, they measured the fluorescence and the circular dichrism and the infrared of the protein at in different viscosities and different temperatures and it, with different denaturants. So they can look at the protein, the fold and the unfolded state at various temperatures using these, uh, using fluorescence, circular decorism, and infrared. So that's what they did. So that is all we've done today. That is all we're going to do today. Um, I have not graded friggin' anything for you guys. So I'm not going to assign anything new. But next week, I'll give out questions for this paper. And um, uh, or if you want, I can give them to you now. Should I give them to you now? 
Okay, everyone gets minus one. Sure. Is it to us now? Do we get more time to work on it? It's a dude. Yeah. Still the same. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If I give it to you now, you get more time. Same due date, but different submission date. Okay. Sure. Okay, I'll give it to you now. Excellent. Everybody saved their butt here collectively. I love it. So, um, so uh, the winner tonight is Carla, our budding biophysicist. Um, coming in second is Kenya. Dan is in third. And then there's a whole bunch. There's me, Richard, Aditya, Adam, and Lily are collectively tied for fourth. And then Hikun, Kai, Ivy, and Pauline are in last place in fifth. Actually, no, they're in fifth place because there are several of us with zero here. Uh, and to get a zero, you actually have to not be here. So good job, everyone. Okay, so we will see everybody next time, and I will I will send out this. Uh, and uh, good job, I'm grading. Everybody's doing fine. No worries, I'll get you your grades shortly. Yay! <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Doctor Tara, are you posting the questions on Canvas? Yes. Okay. okay yes. Also, also, Doctor Terrell. Yes. Um, Carla shared the link to the paper in the chat because it's not on Canvas. Uh, oh my God. Thank you, Carla. The link to the paper in chat because it's not on Canvas. Does that mean like... Um, it's not on Canvas. I just looked it up because I was yeah. interested in it. Oh, are you talking about the one with the... Uh, the Scrooble paper. Oh, the Groovely paper? Yeah, it's not on Canvas. Oh, oh, okay, sorry. But the paper's on Canvas, right? No. No, no, no. Oh, I, I linked part, it. <laughs> just part of the reason why we haven't read it, because it's not on Canvas. You didn't give it to us. Damn. You guys are good, I guess. <laughs> I meant to do that. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I meant to do that. Okay, I'll put it up. <laughs> Thank you guys. I gotta get a life here. Sorry. Good night. Thank you.